So we are going to begin special census today and now try and review some of the things that you've been doing before, you know, like when we're looking at cranial nerves and their functions and you were looking at lobes of the brain and their function because, you know, you, we kind of try and put these together. Um, another important thing is, you know, when we talked first of neurons, remember we talked of different types of neurons. So special senses are ones where all the special senses that you have, taste, um, hearing, equilibrium, smell, uh, vision, all of these have bipolar neurons. So this might be something that you want to kind of write right over the top, you know. So this is a place where you will find bipolar neurons. So let's look at, first we'll begin with vision and we'll look at the eye and uh, we'll begin with the eye, the accessory structures of the eye. I mean, you all know the eyeball is present uh, in the orbit and the eyeball is a huge sphere. It's like a big ball, but it has different radius of curvature. So, you know, the anterior part is kind of curved differently and the posterior part is curved differently and you kind of join two together. What I'm saying is, imagine if you join a small ball and a big ball together and that's when you get the eyeball. So if you join a small ball like this and then join another big one like this, so then this is finally how the eyeball is. Can you see that? That's how the eyeball is formed. The eyeball is present inside the orbit, so you don't really see all of it. All that you see is this front end, about only one-sixth of the eyeball is visible. So it's only this part here that you're actually looking at. But even that part is really important, so it needs to be protected. So it's protected by a number of structures which are known as the accessory organs. So they help to either protect or they lubricate the eye and the eyeball. So let's look at some of them. The first one, of course, are the eyebrows. You know, they're hairy and they prevent sweat from dripping down your face and, you know, particles and so on. So um, there's not much to it. Um, then we have the eyelids, the upper and the lower eyelids, and eyelids are known as palpebrae. They also are protective because, you know, they can close and prevent, again, particles from getting and scratching your eyes. And let's look at some of the things which help um, to make them protective. One is the very nature of the skin and the fact that they can close. Then secondly, at the edge of the lids, you have these lashes, which are hair, which again trap particulate matter, so they've prevented from getting into uh, your um, eye. At the, where the lashes are inserted into the eyelids, at that point, just like hair anywhere in the body, they need to be lubricated. You know, like how, how you had hair on your skin of your hand or anywhere. You had the sebaceous glands which were lubricating them. Similarly, in the eyelid, we have glands which are called ciliary glands. And this helps to lubricate the eyelashes. So they keep it lubricated so that they don't fall off. And it is the ciliary glands and at the end of the hair follicle when there is an infection and you see someone with a red uh, part at the, you know, at the edge of the lid and you usually has a pus point when that is present, when there's an infection, that is known as a sty. Then also present in the eyelids, we have, you know, you want your eyelids to be a bit stiff. You don't want them to be just floppy because you want to be able to open them. So you have a muscle in the eyelid, in the upper eyelid especially, which is called levator palpebri superioris, and you don't need to remember the name. But there's also a sort of plate of connective tissue. That plate of connective tissue is known as the tarsal plate. So what that does is it adds firmness to the eyelid. It's kind of better developed in the, uh, a little bit better developed in the upper than in the lower eyelid, but both places it's, you know, seen quite, uh, fairly quite well developed. This is the one in the upper eyelid, you know, the fact that you can kind of turn your eyelid inside out, that's what the tarsal plate kind of helps you to do. And you notice actually your eye, the fluid, the lacrimal gland, actually it doesn't kind of dry up, you know, our, our eyelids are never, our eye, eyeball is never dry, right? So we produce lacrimal fluid, but these tarsal uh, plate, they also have glands in them. So inside this plate, you also have glands. And those glands secrete a fluid which is a little bit oily in nature. And that kind of prevents the lacrimal fluid from totally drying off. Okay. So they, and they also help to lubricate the lashes. 
and then lining the inner aspect of the eyelid so you can see this is the inner aspect of the upper eyelid the inner aspect of the lower eyelid and then being reflected on the surface of the eyeball like this this is a thin membranous layer so lining the inner aspect of this upper eyelid going on the eyeball and then lining the inner aspect of the lower eyelid can you see this membranous layer which is present this membranous layer is known as the conjunctiva this is the one which when it gets inflamed it gets really red and you get up you call it conjunctivitis or pink eye you've heard of that right pink eye so this is the part which is which becomes inflamed and you know you start secreting a lot more fluid at that time and eyes get very very sticky which tells you that normally the conjunctiva also secretes it secretes mucus which again helps to lubricate the eye eyeball and if you were to close your eyelid so imagine if the eyelids were closed so what would happen is that suppose this eyelid was closed like this and this one was closed this way so can you see the conjunctiva would then be form a little sac like that right that is known as the conjunctival sac when the eyelids are closed when the eyelids are open then you can see the sac is open it is kind of just here like this okay so when the eyelid is totally closed when the palpebrae are closed then that part is kind of called the conjunctival sac and normally whenever you put um any um a medication into your eye what do you do you kind of pull this lower eyelid away and you kind of actually put the medication here inside this conjunctival sac so that then it spreads around and you know helps to perform whatever it's supposed to do okay um and as i said it lines the eyelids and the inner uh, anterior surface of the eyeball and lubricant in function and if conjunctiva is inflamed that's when you get what is called pink eye the other accessory organ is the lacrimal apparatus which has its gland and ducts and you know it goes so these also help to lubricate the eyeball keep it moist and here's when you've got to recall remember we did last time we talked of autonomic nervous system right and we talked of autonomic reflexes and i said whenever there was anything to do with smooth muscle or cardiac muscle or glands it was autonomic it was an autonomic reflex then we also said when we were talking about that that the glands which are uh, supplied by the sympathetic nervous system can you think of any gland which is supplied by the sympathetic nervous system or they are the only glands supplied by the sympathetic nervous system no not the pituitary pituitary is a whole whole organ by itself i'm talking about little glands like you know lacrimal salivary sweat glands sebaceous sweat glands remember sympathetic when you're scared you sweat sweat glands are supplied by the sympathetic nervous system all other glands like your lacrimal gland your salivary glands your glands of the gastrointestinal tract your glands of the respiratory tract remember these all secrete when you're at rest so they are parasympathetic okay so the first thing is that's why if you look up here the lacrimal gland it is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system and it is supplied by the seventh cranial nerve the parasympathetic component which goes with the seventh so here's one of the functions of the seventh cranial nerve you know when you were doing cranial nerve you have to know the functions one of the functions is it supplies muscles of facial expression then later we'll see it also carries taste now you know another one it supplies the lacrimal gland it also actually helps in salivation so you can see whenever there's a lacrimatory reflex or salivatory reflex it's the parasympathetic part which is a reflex which is working and it's through the seventh cranial nerve okay so let's see this whole lacrimal apparatus so we have this gland called the lacrimal gland which is present as you can see in relation to the eye it is present on the lateral part of the eye in the orbit up here in the orbit there's a little sort of fossa present here in the orbit called the lacrimal fossa which is where the gland is is present uh this gland has many ducts you can see these ducts these ducts uh pass through and they open into the conjunctival sac so over here so they are opening into the conjunctival sac 
when you blink your eyes what happens is that blinking movement helps to push the fluid which will first collect here on the lateral aspect it will help to push it uh, forward medially right so the lacrimal fluid or which is called tears that comes medially when it comes to the medial end you know you don't want to keep forming fluid and not have it drain because what will happen otherwise then it will just sort of keep pouring out of your eyes right you would just be streaming having tears fall down your cheeks all the time which doesn't happen it happens only when you cry because then those emotional tears are more lacrimal fluid is produced than can drain and that's why it falls over your tears but normally we keep producing lacrimal fluid but we don't have tears running down right so what happens how is it drained if you when you go home today what i want you all to do is that in the go in front of the mirror and if you pull down your eyelid you will notice in relation to the medial end of both eyelids you see a kind kind of a tiny little hole present this little hole here and this one here you can try it on look you, you know that i can see yeah. see each other right you've seen that right yes you had a question philip relevant but is there a scientific um, explanation is there a scientific explanation of why people cry well it's an emotional um uh, one of the things it, it's an emotional response when you cry there is pain associated with it and uh, when you cry a substance called p substance is liberated which is washed away with the tears so and that kind of helps relieve that pain uh when you when you get rid of that p substance uh, which get gets rid of the pain it kind of makes your body less stressed which is they say which is why some most of the time women tend to be less prone to ha- heart attacks i mean there are other things than men because men tend to bottle up their emotions as much they don't cry as much women tend to cry more often so maybe the the p substance is kind of liberating you know getting liberated and getting washed away so stress levels are being decreased so that's that's one of those things okay so here this at this uh, medial a- edge of the eyelids there's a small little hole present which is known as the lacrimal punctum this punctum as you can see actually leads into two ducts you can see these tiny ducts so there's one on the top and there's one below these two ducts are very very small so they are known as canaliculus you remember when we did the bone and we talked of those osteocytes connecting to each other by canaliculi they were like thin ducts so canaliculus is just a small canal So these are called lacrimal canaliculus. So you produce lacrimal fluid here through ducts it goes into the conjunctival sac by blinking it gets pushed medially it passes through this punctum and goes into the lacrimal canaliculus which at the medial end opens into a little sac here which is known as the lacrimal sac you can see the sac is dilated so it can collect the fluid and then this sac leads into a duct which goes into the nose So this duct is known as the nasolacrimal duct just to tell you that it connects the nose to the lacrimal sac. So all of the fluid then finally drains into a a part of the nose which is called the inferior meatus of the nasal cavity. Meatus means an opening. This is the reason why when you cry a lot you tend to feel stuffy because so much of the fluid is draining and is going down and that's why even your nose runs when you're cr- crying. That's one of the reasons. Also in some people these puncta might be blocked and so what happens the fluid keeps coming out so then you know the tears kind of keep dripping over so they have to surgically surgically open up those puncta or these canaliculi they may be blocked to very due to various reasons okay the lacrimal fluid is very useful i told you a little bit about the p substance the other thing is it has lysozymes in it which are antibacterial in nature so not only does it just by the sheer a volume of flushing away something it flushes away um stuff which might get into your eye but it also has this antibacterial property so it prevents growth or colonization of bacteria in your eye so constantly being removed okay so let's answer a few questions here so dirt enters the conjunctival conjunctival sac and causes tears to flow what kind of a reflex would this be
Okay, most of you got it right. Yes, it's a parasympathetic. Remember, I'm saying tears, meaning formed by a gland. So it's a glandular secretion. So it tears, it's tears. Yes, the cranial nerve seventh is responsible, but it's not a somatic. When we use the word somatic, it has to do with skeletal muscle or uh, do, to do with skin, right? So here I'm talking about a gland. So it has to be parasympathetic or sympathetic. Those should be your only two choices. And in this case, it's parasympathetic, okay? Then let's look at the muscles which move the eyeball. These extrinsic muscles are also known as extraocular muscles. Extra meaning outside the eye. So they are also called extraocular muscles. And they are called extrinsic because they are outside the eyeball. They are not present inside the eyeball. Muscles present inside the eyeball, you will see, and I've talked of it earlier. You know, we talk, when we talked of sympathetic and parasympathetic and we were talking about constrictor pupillae and dilator pupillae, which were smooth muscles, which either cause constriction or dilation of the pupil. Those are intrinsic muscles. These are outside. And what do they do? They cause your eyeball to move. So in other words, you know, say when you look medially, for example, if I told you to look towards the left of, of the room. So at that time, so let's say you have the two eyes, you look this side, can you see one muscle is going to make your this eyeball move laterally, the other one is going to make this one move medially. Can you see? They have to act together. If you do the opposite, look up. There will be muscles which kind of make your eye look up like that or look down. Okay, So these are the muscles which, which uh, move the eyeball. We have four of them which are known as recti. So it's called lateral rectus, medial rectus, superior rectus, inferior rectus. And we have two which are known as oblique muscles. They're called superior and inferior oblique. I don't want you to know too many details about them and what each muscle do. Each muscle has a very specific action. Uh, but I'm not interested in your trying to remember that, that at this stage. Now these muscles are supplied by, and again, here's where your cranial nerve function comes into play. So where you have to learn cranial nerves. If you remember, we had in the cranial nerve functions, there were these muscles, these nerves which moved the muscle, the eyeball, which supplied muscles which moved the eyeball. So these are the third, fourth, and sixth. So third, fourth, and sixth. The oculomotor, oculo for eye and motor to the eye means muscle. Trochlear, it's called trochlear because you can see there is this trochlear. There's a little sort of projection in the orbit through which one of these oblique muscles <coughs> passes. So that's why the nerve is called trochlear. And there is the sixth, which is called the abducens nerve. So third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerves supply these muscles, okay? Then let's go to act now the actual eyeball itself. So the eyeball has three coats. It has to be well protected because the innermost coat is where you have the receptors that can sense light, which gives you the visual perception, you know, the photoreceptors as you call them. So we need things to protect it. We also need things to provide nerve supply. We also need for here because, you know, your pupils have to constrict and dilate depending on whether you want light to not go in or you want more light to go in. So you have all of this, these functions to be carried out. So let's look at the three coats and we'll start from the outside. So the outermost coat is, is very thick and fibrous. Naturally, it's like dura method. It's got to be thick so that it can be protected. There's no point having a flimsy coat on the outside if it's protected. So this coat has two parts to it. Most of it which is present posteriorly is called, is white and it's opaque. And this is called sclera. So remember I said only one-sixth of the eyeball is, vis is what you can see, right? So if, I, if you look at the eyeball like this, this is the only part, this area is what you can see from the front. All of this is embedded in fat inside the orbit. You cannot see that, right? So this little part which you can see is the white of your eye, which you all look at, which is the sclera. The rest of the sclera is all at the back. You cannot see it. Very thick and fibrous. And then in front, you cannot make it opaque because you see light pass has to pass all the way through like this and hit the retina. And then from the retina, the optic nerve fibers will start and take it to the occipital lobe, right? Which is the lobe for vision. So if you make something opaque here, you won't be able to see anything, right? So this front part, the sclera continues in front as a transparent 
membrane which is known as the cornea. So the cornea is present anteriorly. The reason it's transparent is so that it allows light rays to pass through. You cannot see it over. When you look at your eye, the colored part you see is actually the iris. And the reason you can see that colored part is because your cornea is transparent. Okay. Sometimes when people have a corneal injury and, you know, you might see sometimes they have an opacity, that part, you know, it becomes opaque. So there's like a sort of white spot on the surface of the cornea. Then the light rays will get refracted there. So they, you know, they won't be able to see properly. So you're always worried about corneal injury. Now, because the, the cornea is transparent, because it does not have any blood vessels. And that is an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is, uh, well, it doesn't have blood vessels, so that makes it transparent, light rays can pass through. But it needs, it depends on other substances for diffusion, which is why you have all that fluid present so that, you know, through diffusion it can pass through, the oxygen can pass through, nutrients can pass through and supply the cornea. The other advantage for us is because it doesn't have a blood supply, it is, uh, you know, when you transplant a cornea onto somebody else, you can do that because there are no blood vessels involved. The body does not see it as foreign. So therefore, you can transplant a, co a cornea from a cadaver onto anybody else's body, you know, within reasonable time. Uh, uh, there's a period in, within which you can do that. And it's not going to cause a reaction. So that helps us, you know, to do these corneal transplant. Anything that has a blood vessel, automatically you have to worry are their antigens different from ours and you can have a reaction between those, you know, those two people. The next coat, the second coat is, uh, is called the mid, uh, vascular middle coat because it has a lot of blood vessels. So imagine now you'll have a second coat. So if I was to draw the second coat, this at the back, it has three parts to it. At the back, it begins as what is called the choroid. So it's, there's, that part is pigmented. This is the choroid. This choroid moves in front and becomes a part which is kind of a little fringed, which we'll, we'll see these pictures. I'm just kind of drawing it a little bit like this for you. This part in the middle is known as the ciliary body. So that's the intermediate part. And then the ciliary body goes further in front and becomes what is known as the iris. Okay, so can you see the three parts? Choroid. Then we have the ciliary body. And the, this one continues as the iris. Okay. So we will see some parts of it. The ciliary body, notice how I drew it. I kind of drew it a little bit like fringed like this because it has a muscle in it which is called the ciliaris muscle. This muscle is responsible. It helps. This muscle kind of helps in something known as accommodation. Accommodation is a, a, is a reflex which we do. If you look at something further you know, really far away and then quickly look at something close by, you will notice that your, you know, pupils constrict, your eyes move medially and what happens is the curvature of the lens increases. So this ciliaris muscle actually helps to increase that curvature of the lens. So that's how it helps in this accommodation. And it also has these little processes called ciliary processes. And later we'll see right now it just remember that it produces a fluid which is very similar to cerebrospinal fluid. That fluid is called aqueous humor. The word humor in olden days meant fluids. So your body fluids were known as humors, like blood was a humor. Aqueous is a humor. So it is just a fluid. The word, you must wonder why do they use the word humor? Humor is for fluid. It's a Latin word used for fluid. So that's the second part. And then the third part, which is the anterior most, this is the colored part. This is the one which has a lot of pigment and gives the eye its color. And this has two smooth muscles in it. One which is called the sphincter pupillae, which is under parasympathetic control. And another one which is called dilator pupillae, which is under sympathetic control. So these are smooth muscles. And these are also, we will see these, these are also known as intrinsic muscles. Intrinsic because they are inside the eyeball. Okay? The others, the extraocular, they were outside the eyeball. So they were known as extrinsic. 
Now, when you go to the lab, this is a time where actually you should look at all of these. So these coats, when we draw a picture like this, when we draw a picture like this, it sometimes becomes a little difficult for you to understand that the iris is is not, you know, it's it's cut in a sagittal plane. But the iris is really, if you look at it, the iris is actually like this with a hole in the center. So this is the whole iris and this hole which is present in the center is what is known as the pupil. Okay, And then this will continue on the side like this with the ciliary body which will go even further and become the choroid. So it's kind of like a whole ball with the choroid, ciliary body and then the iris. But in the, in the case of the iris there's a big hole in the center which forms the pupil. And that's how when this, if there's constriction the pupil will become smaller. If there's dilation the pupil will get larger. Okay. So those were the first two coats. The third coat we have is called the retina. It is made up really of 10 layers. The outermost layer, the one which is in contact with the choroid is what is pigmented. And the reason it's got pigment is because pigment absorbs light. It does not allow too much light to pass through the uh, through the rest of the layers so that you know this excess light can be absorbed and the retina the rest of the retina is not damaged and the other nine layers together actually are called nervous layer because they are full of nerve cells or receptors so for example they have these photoreceptors called rods and cones they have bipolar cells and they have cells called ganglion cells we'll see these one after the other one receptor will sort of synapse on the bipolar bipolar will synapse on the ganglion and it's these ganglion cells which finally give rise to the optic nerve. So I have it here. So the axons of the ganglion cells give rise to the optic nerve which passes out of the eye. And that's how it takes the perception of vision to the occipital lobe. And that's how you know that you've seen something, right? Now the photoreceptors, that's rods and cones, they both have different functions. The way you're going to remember this is... So let's do cones first. So C, cones, C for color vision. So cones help in color vision. And when can you see color? If something is very dark, you cannot make out whether it's bright red or dull gray or, you know, like that, right? So in bright light, you can see color better. So therefore, you can, that's how you'll remember. Cones help with color vision and for us to perceive bright light. And they also help with something known as visual acuity. That means sharpness of vision. You know, when you focus on something really sharp and think of it only when there is bright light, can you see something really well? If I turned off the lights and this room was absolutely dark, I would not be able to make out your faces really well. I would be able to tell that you are sitting, but I wouldn't be able to tell what color um, jacket you're wearing or what color t-shirt you're wearing or things like that, right? So again, only in bright light are you able to really see sh things sharply. So that's known as visual acuity. So you can understand how cones are responsible for that. Rods do the exact opposite. They help us to see in dim light. So when light is really dim, the cone, uh, the rods, they produce a pigment which is known as rhodopsin. That's what helps us to see in dim light. And rods are also important for peripheral vision. And think of it, you know, when you focus on something really sharp, you kind of go in like a, almost like a tunnel vision. You kind of just focus at that point. But when, in dim light, you want a lot of light to enter into your eyes so that you can see not only in front, but you also want to be able to see on the sides, right? So that's how you're going to remember that rods help to see in dim light, but also help with peripheral vision. Now let's see where these two structures are concentrated like where are cones concentrated and where are rods concentrated mm -hmm. forget this part i will so you can just read it but we will when i go to the picture i will show you since rods help us to see peripheral vision you will see that in the retina of the eyeball towards the periphery that's where rods are concentrated so if you want to see peri things peripherally obviously you want the rods to be there right so that's where they're going to be concentrated Cones, on the other hand, are concentrated in these two areas, and I'll talk about this when I show you the image. 
So here now let's look at some of the things that we just discussed. So I have them kind of um, in the same colors for, you know, the green is the outer layer, the red is the innermost layer, and this um, sort of orange is the middle layer, okay? So let's look at this outermost layer. So here is this outer sclera, fibrous layer. So can you see it is forming most of the outermost coat? Can you see that? And then just in front, it is replaced by this cornea, which is transparent. So you can see that this is opaque. Next to it, the second layer or the middle coat is the choroid. It's, for, it's got three parts. Posteriorly, you can see choroid. So notice how this choroid is kind of attached to the sclera here. And here again is the choroid. It's a vascular layer, so it's got lots of blood vessels, as you can see. As it continues forwards, notice as it continues forwards, it gets this little fringe-like thing here. This part here is called the ciliary body. So this area here is called the ciliary body, which has these little things called ciliary processes. And also has this, can you see these kind of thread-like structures, which is known as the suspensory ligament. You can see they are suspending the lens from it. Okay. So when the ciliary body pulls, so imagine when it pulls, it's going to pull this way. So when it pulls this way, what is it going to the lens? It's due to the lens. It's going to kind of make the lens flat like that. When the ciliary body, the ciliaris muscle in that body, when it relaxes, this le these ligaments get relaxed, so the lens becomes even more curved. And that's what happens when we have that accommodation reflex. Okay, So that's how you can see it changes the curvature of the lens. So that's the function of that ciliary body, the ciliaris muscle in the ciliary body. These processes we'll see later, these processes are the ones which produce the aqueous humor, which I'll talk about. And then anteriorly, this ciliary body continues as the iris. So here it's a cut section, so you're only seeing a part of the iris. In the center, the iris is, there's a hole in it, so it's not a complete diaphragm. So that's the pupil because you want light to pass through. So light has to pass all the way through like this in order to hit the retina because that's where the rods and cones are, right? So in order to pass through, see, first thing it will hit will be the cornea which is transparent so it allows light to pass through. Then next it passes through this little sort of chamber which has this thin fluid which we'll see which is called aqueous humor. Then it passes through the lens which again is transparent. Normally when you peep through your eye through the pupil you see it black right through the pupil. It's black because the, the lens is transparent. And if you look at go home and look at your grandmother or grandfather's uh, those who have not had a cataract operation, and if they have a cataract, uh, you'll notice that when you look through the pupil, you'll see that you can actually see white. It's a little whitish because the, the, cat, the lens has now become opaque. When it becomes opaque, you can see white shining through, which is why as they get a cataract, they are not able to see properly because light's not able to pass through. But in us, uh, those of us who don't have cataracts, the, you know, it's transparent. So light passes through that, then it passes through this part, and then it hits the retina. So can you see all the pathway has to be absolutely clear for light to pass through. Anywhere there's a problem, light will not be able to pass through. Okay. And then the third layer is the retina. So you can see this is the retina up here. And it is attached to the choroid. So the choroid is in between. On one side it's attached to the sclera, on the other side to the retina. And in the retina, what you will notice is this is where the retina has, remember I said it had 10 layers, right? It had one was pigmented and then it had a number of these um, nerves that was called the nervous layer. So it had a number of these cells. So if I just draw all these cells like that over here in the retina, the axons of those cells pass out and they become the optic nerve. And these are ganglion cells. Their axons pass out and they become the optic nerve up here. So at this point where this optic nerve passes out, this area is known as the optic disc. So this area where this optic nerve is passing out of the eyeball, because this is the one, the optic nerve, what is its function? Vision. To take it to the occipital cortex, right? So it goes to the occipital cortex, occipital lobe. So where this optic nerve passes out, 
at that point you do not have any rods and cones because if you had rods and cones it would interfere with it passing out right so this area is called the blind spot so that means there are no photoreceptors in the region of the optic disc you have blood vessels there and the blood vessels are the artery and vein of the retina no photoreceptors so if light falls on the optic disc that's why it's such a small area if light falls there you don't see anything that's a blind spot that area but just lateral to the optic disc and that's what was described in the slide before just lateral to the optic disc you see an area present like a circular area that circular area is called macula lutea it's a little yellowish in color that's how it gets the word macula you've heard of macular degeneration you may have heard of that that that's an area which this is the area which gets involved and in the center of this macula lutea right in the center that's why you have the word centralis fovea means like a spot so the central spot in the macula lutea is called fovea centralis this fovea centralis is the point where you have the sharpest vision what was responsible for really sharp vision rods or cones cones, cones remember so cones are concentrated in this fovea centralis so they are concentrated even in this macula lutea but more of it in the fovea centralis got that okay so here in this area is where you will find cones and rods more of the rods are present towards the periphery of the eyeball because of the retina because that's they are important for peripheral vision so this is where you will see rods in the periphery and cones more concentrated in this area and most in this area they are present here also but more over there because you want visual acuity okay so here let's look at this video enables us to see length, width, depth and distance of an object. The eye has three layers: the sclera, choroid and retina. Not here, right? Okay. The location of the eyes enables us to see length, width, depth, and distance of an object. The eye has three layers: the sclera, choroid, and retina. The sclera is the outer white layer that maintains the shape of the eye. Muscles attached to the sclera control eye movements. Choroid is the middle layer that contains the blood vessels. The cornea is a clear circular area in the sclera where light enters the eye. The pupil is the circular opening in the front of the choroid. The iris is the colored smooth muscle surrounding the pupil, which adjusts the size of the opening according to the brightness of light. The lens is located behind the pupil and between the anterior and posterior chambers. The lens is a transparent, flexible biconvex structure. Bends or refracts light rays, so they focus on the nerve cells of them. The chambers are filled with watery fluid that gives shape to the eye and helps refract the light rays. The anterior fluid is called the aqueous humor. The posterior fluid is called the aqueous humor. The retina inner layer and contains the nerve cells, buds and cones, and the bipolar cells. Rods are sensitive to light, but its color. Cones sense color. The highest concentration of cones is in the fovea centralis. The rods and cones synapse with bi synapse with the ganglia cells whose axons form the optic nerve. Enter the eye through the cornea, pupil, and lens, where the light ray is stimulus. 
then to the occipital lobe of the brain for interpretation. So how all, all those kind of layers acted together. Now we can see muscles of the iris. So these were intrinsic muscles. Remember, because they belong to the eyeball, they're inside the eyeball. They're also smooth muscle. Those extrinsic were skeletal. These are smooth muscle because remember they're skeletal. You can you can voluntarily control those. You can't control whether your pupils are going to constrict or dilate, but you can control whether you want to look up, down, right, left, you know, oblique, that way. So here, look at this. So here is the iris, which is the diaphragm. And inside it, you have two muscles. One is called the sphincter, one is called the dilator. So here's a good review for you. Good slide. So that's why I always tell you, look at the slides very, very carefully. Look at this. Sphincter muscle, sphincter pupil contracts, the pupil size decreases. So it's kind of a circular muscle and it's under parasympathetic control. So remember, one of the functions of the parasympathetic nervous system was constriction of the pupil. So it's repeated here. Dilator pupillae, so when it contracts, it kind of pulls away and the pupil dilates. Sympathetic, remember I said your eye, eye, your pupils dilate with fear. And remember sympathetic was one of those systems which kind of was active when you were scared, right? So sympathetic is for dilator, parasympathetic is for constriction or sphincter pupillae. Now here we are looking at those different layers as shown nicely in that video. So this is the pigmented layer. This area here you can see is the pigmented layer which reads, leads to these photoreceptors, rods and cones. Notice how then they synapse with these bipolar cells which then go on to becoming synapsing with these ganglion cells and these ganglion cells, their axons form the optic nerve. And light actually what happens is when light comes, it actually passes through all these layers first comes to this pigmented layer, some of that light is absorbed, the rest of it actually stimulates this and then it goes this way, the impulse, and then travels out through the optic nerve. So imagine it's kind of like taking a right angle bend and coming back all the way and then going out. So that's how light actually passes through. And here again you can see this optic disc, this area where no photoreceptors are present. And um, you know, you remember the meninges that we did when we were doing the brain? And we said, remember, majority of the cranial nerves come out, are attached, or they come out from the brain stem. But the first and the second don't. The first is through the nose and, you know, passes into the olfactory bulb. And the second optic nerve is really kind of continues from the brain. So that's how sometimes you often say the first and second are not true cranial nerves. So those meninges which surround the brain, they actually also go and surround the optic nerve and, you know, like this. So the subarachnoid space surrounds that. And you may have seen sometimes when people have head injuries, they always do an eye exam to see if there's anything wrong. You know, if there's a raised intracranial pressure or something. The reason is that if, suppose the intracranial pressure rises, it will rise here also because the subarachnoid space is enveloping the optic nerve. So when that rises, it will kind of push on this optic nerve. So the disc will actually sort of bulge like this. And that an ophthalmologist can actually see. And then you know that there is a problem. And, you know, these blood vessels may be a little kinked or they may see areas where the blood vessels, you cannot see the blood flow properly in that area. So the optic disc tells you a lot about what's going on inside the brain. And um, I don't know if I mentioned, so between this layer number one and the next nine layers, this is the space where you might have heard of where people have retinal detachment. So it really occurs between the first and the other nine nervous layers. So that's the spot where it occurs. And if it detaches completely, obviously the impulses cannot go through and then, you know, blindness will result. So let's do a little bit of review. Which are the nerves involved in the movements of the eyeball? Obviously supplying the muscles which will be producing the movements of the eyeball. So you must know Roman numerals and you must know the names of these cranial nerves.
Very good. Yes. Third, fourth, and sixth. Uh, it's not this. It's not second. The second only is for vision, just being able to perceive light. It's not fifth. No one took that. It's it's not the fifth again here. So you know, be very careful when you look at these um, Roman numerals. Okay, what does the middle coat of the eyeball consist of? Good. Choroid, ciliary body, and iris. So you can think of it as CCI. Choroid, ciliary body, and the iris. That is it. Sclera is the outermost coat. Cornea is also part, these two are both part of the outermost coat. And the retina is the innermost coat. So again, so neither of these are correct. Okay. Is this true or false? True. It is true. Yes. Where would you find the preponderance of rods? Preponderance meaning collection, more, predominance. Along the periphery of the eyeball, in the macula lutea, it's again the cones. At the optic disc, there are no rods or cones. Remember, no photoreceptors in that area. Which system is responsible for pupillary dilation? I want everybody to get this right. Sympathetic. Remember sympathetic. Okay, sympathetic nervous system. Remember, you're scared, you're stressed, sympathetic acts. So think of it this way. So here's a person, sympathetic acts, hair stands up. Okay, because you're scared, right? Erector pylorum, the sympathetic supplies that. Pupils get really dilated. You want to see better. Okay. You get pale, so they look pale. I mean, you know, there's no color on that. Right. And um, you sweat, so let's see. You're sweating. Um, yeah. Those sympathetic and parasympathetic, they're one, one, it's the opposite of the They, are, they do the opposite. So the parasympathetic is constriction. And somatic has nothing to do with pupillary activity because it's smooth muscle, okay? So this is how you're going to remember. Okay. 
So now we were doing chambers and uh, we mentioned, you know, how light passes. I also mentioned, use the word aqueous humor. So let's look at what, what was I talking about. So here, if you look at the eyeball, and I'm kind of going to go back a few slides. And I'm going to go back to this slide because this is... Uh, Let me look at this slide. So when we look at this slide, so let's first just look at this one. And notice here is the lens, okay? So it divides the eyeball. There's, it can divide it into a part in front of the lens and a part behind the lens, right? So the part in front of the lens is known this area. In other words, from here to here. This area is called the anterior segment. So this is the area in front of the lens. Okay, it's called the anterior segment. The area behind the lens would be this area. So this is called posterior segment. And this posterior segment contains vitreous humor. It contains a, this vitreous humor is a little bit more jelly-like. So notice how the posterior segment contains vitreous humor. This anterior segment contains aqueous humor, which is very much like cerebrospinal fluid. So it's very thin, watery fluid, okay? Then looking at this picture, I don't want you to get confused. So just pay attention to what I'm saying. This, I'm only now going to talk about this anterior segment, this part, right? This area in front of the lens, now, in front of the lens, what happens is be between the lens and this cornea, this iris diaphragm is present. Can you see this? The iris is present. So it's kind of the iris is interfering in between them. So what it does is it divides this anterior segment, this area, into two parts. There's a part between the cornea and the iris, and there's a part between the iris and the lens. Have you followed that? Right? Right? A part between the cornea and the iris, which is this area. And then there's this area between the iris and the lens. Both of these are still in front of the, of the lens. But one is between the before the iris and one is behind the iris. Okay? So this anterior chamber is divided, sorry, anterior segment. This anterior segment is further divided into what is called an anterior chamber. And it's further divided into something called a posterior chamber. The only reason I'm mentioning is this is because of the way this aqueous humor is formed. Okay. So have you followed this? So first is the eyeball is divided into an anterior and a posterior segment by the lens. The anterior segment is further divided into an anterior chamber and a posterior chamber because of the presence of the iris. Okay, so now let's just go to the slide we were looking at. So here we are just concentrating on, we've only taken one part and we've magnified it. So here is the lens. So it's divided this eyeball into this whole part which is called the anterior segment. It's divided this part into the posterior segment. Notice the posterior segment contains this jelly-like fluid called vitreous humor. This vitreous humor is, is formed in fetal life and it's present throughout. It's not like constantly made or removed. Whatever was formed remains in the eyeball. It gives the eyeball shape. This chamber, the anterior segment, this is the one which contains this thin fluid called aqueous humor. And this anterior chamber, as I said, is further divided into this part, which was called anterior chamber, and this part, which was called posterior chamber. So this anterior segment has an anterior chamber and a posterior chamber. I mean, that's just so that you don't get confused. Why are they calling it this? I'm giving you, um, you know, I'm sort of explaining that. So what happens is that this area here, which was part of the core, uh, you know, the second middle vascular layer, this was called the ciliary body. If you remember when I drew it, I drew those little fringe-like processes known as ciliary processes. 
these ciliary processes produce aqueous humor. So when it is produced, it goes into this posterior chamber. It travels from there. Then it passes out through this pupil because this is that hole which is present in the iris. It passes out through there and comes into this anterior chamber. They are both still in the anterior segment. And if you kind of again think back on cerebrospinal fluid, remember cerebrospinal fluid was formed by choroid plexus. It traveled through all the ventricles and all of that and then went into the subarachnoid space. But we didn't want it to keep forming and not getting reabsorbed, right? So then it was finally reabsorbed. Where was cerebrospinal fluid reabsorbed? Into the veins, yes, in the veins. Remember, in the veins, it finally went into the veins by means of something known as arachnoid villi, right? So similarly here, if you keep producing aqueous humor and you don't remove it, what will happen? These chambers are going to get larger and larger. Your intraocular pressure is going to rise. Your eyeball is going to get really big, right? It can rupture also. So you have to remove it. I mean, you only need so much to... You only need so much to make, you know, to nourish the eyeball. So while it's being formed here, travels here, and then it nourishes all of this, it actually also has to get removed. So to remove it, we have a vein present. This vein is a little dilated. Remember, even in the brain, we call them venous sinuses. So here, this vein is known as the scleral venous sinus because it's present in the sclera. So produced by the ciliary processes, travels through like this and it's absorbed into the scleral venous sinus. If there is a problem anywhere in between, imagine if this starts producing more or there's an area here which is blocked or even the scleral venous sinus is blocked because, you know, somebody had some, some inflammation and blocked. What happens? This keeps getting produced but it's not absorbed so the an aqueous humor will keep on increasing. So that will increase the intraocular pressure would increase. Second, it would make when the pressure inside the eyeball increases, it also makes the eyeball very hard. When it's hard, it kind of interferes with, you know, presses on the retina and so on. So you will find the vision, the person will have visual problems. So there'll be problems in vision. This is what is known as something which you all have heard of, which is known as glaucoma. So glaucoma is a condition where there is too much aqueous humor, whatever the reason may be, too much production or not being removed, making the intraocular pressure rise, eyeball becomes hard, person has difficulty seeing because it kind of compresses. If it becomes hard, it will compress on the retina, okay? So let's see how aqueous humor is produced and removed. The eye, eye contains two types of humors that are essential in maintaining its size and shape. The large space behind the lens is filled with a gel-like substance called the vitreous humor. It helps to maintain the shape of the eye and its intraocular pressure. The aqueous humor is produced by cells covering the ciliary body. The liquid flows from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber through the pupil. Drainage of the aqueous humor occurs through the canal. Overproduction is the, the canal is, is the scleral venous sinus. That's another name for it, okay? This area here is canal of Schlem is the scleral venous sinus. Overproduction of aqueous humor or inadequate drainage leads to increased intraocular pressure as seen in glaucoma. Pardon? Is that the only cause? Yes. Now let's look at visual pathway. Now this visual pathway is a bit more complicated than you would um, uh, think. But here are some things that I want you to take away from this. The optic nerves take impulses from each eye, right? So they are responsible for carrying vision from each eye. But if you notice up here, can you see when the optic nerves kind of meet, and you must have seen when you did the brain and even when we were doing cranial nerves, the optic nerves meet at a point here, which is known as the optic chiasma. Do you see that? 
And can you see that there is kind of crossing over at the optic chiasma? So some of the fibers cross over here from one eye, some fibers cross over here from another eye. So what really happens is that when you look at an object, the object has a field of vision. So imagine like for over here. So if you're looking at an object up here, so you can see there's a right field of vision and there's a left field of vision. Okay. So these field of fields of vision, they project on the opposite parts of the retina. And what finally happens is that, and you know, if we represent a field of vision by, let's say, this side is the left occipital cortex and this side is the right occipital cortex. And I say that this is the right field of vision in yellow and this is the left field of vision in blue. Can you notice, so I'm going, just so that you understand, so this is the, so this is the left and this is the right. And I'll say this is the right field of vision. And this is the left field of vision, okay? So notice that when one field of vision goes to the op opposite occipital cortex, can you see that? So the left occipital cortex is responsible for seeing the right field of vision. The right occipital cortex is responsible for seeing the left field of vision. Can you understand? So when you look at an object, it has a right and a left field. So from the right side, the impulses will all travel and somehow they'll make their way into the left occipital lobe and the opposite for the other field of vision. Okay, have you followed that? So if this part here is damaged, then nothing, if the optic nerve is damaged, can you understand the vision from this cannot go out? So then the person becomes absolutely blind. Whereas when, if the lobe is damaged, the, then you understand it will be a loss of a field of vision and not of the entire I, okay? So that's really um, important, which is what is mentioned here. So let's look at this question. Suppose she suffers, this person suffers a blow on the right side of his, uh, he, uh, of his head and it damaged his right occipital cortex. What do you think this will lead to? Okay, well, good. Most of you got this right. It's right side is injured, so left field of vision is is gone. Remember, in the body, everything is controlled opposite, right? If the right motor cortex is damaged, the left half of the body gets involved, isn't it? So again, you can see it will be opposite field of vision. So it's not the eye or not the same side of field of vision. It will be the opposite field of vision, okay? If the optic nerve is damaged, then the eye will be blind. So here, 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 the same thing. See, every over whether it's here, 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 it will still be the field because see the all yellow fibers. Can you see that? But if it's here, then this whole, nothing can go out of the eye, right? So it, you can't, it's like blocking the exit. So then it will be blindness of that eye. Uh, if it occurs here, for example, if it occurs, is that what you are wanting to ask? No, the yellow uh, nerve. Yes, it will be, uh, when we say field of vision, it will be both eyes that, right, that field of vision will go. Right? Because remember, we see with both eyes, but the image we get is the eye actually, see, can you see that you get, we have binocular vision. So the images are merged like that and we see one whole thing, right? So the, but we all have a bit of peripheral vision. Can you see this side is only right eye, this side is only left eye, but this is the part we are seeing like this together, okay? Yeah, so both eyes, but in both eyes, it's that field of vision, okay?
Here are some eye conditions. I mean, this is just more for general um, knowledge. Um, and a normal eye is what is called an emetropic eye. You know, everything is normal. The light, the focal, uh, you know, the eye size is normal. Uh, so when light rays focus, they focus right there at the retina, at that fovea centralis. You're able to see really well. If someone has what is called myopia or nearsighted, that means they can see near things, but they cannot see distant things. In these people, the eyeball is too long. So what happens is because it's long, everything gets focused in front of the retina and then it gets dispersed. So by the time it comes, because from distant objects, you know, light rays are parallel. So by the time it comes to the retina, it's got dispersed, which is why when they look at anything far away, they can't see it well. It kind of is blurry. And so you give them a concave lens and that corrects it. If someone is what is called hyperopic, that means they're farsighted, that means they can see distant objects, but they can't see anything very near. So here the eyeball is too short, so here things will focus behind the retina, and so you have to give them a different kind of lens. And as we get older, what happens is, you know, your lens has to kind of adapt. Remember I told you that ciliary body, where, how the muscle kind of relaxes that suspensory ligament? So these, all these get kind of little loose and lax, and they're not able to do that. So that's why, you know, reading becomes a bit of a problem. You can look at something far, but when you come close by to read, you know, the lens doesn't, the curvature doesn't go the way it should go, and that's what's known as press biopia, and so that's why you need glasses for that. Okay? So let's stop here.